everyone. Welcome to the DevOps track, now that you're all awake this afternoon. Uh, I'm Jeff Sheltrin, one of the uh, track chairs, and I just wanted to introduce uh, our first featured speaker, Case Cook. Uh, he previously worked at Canonical, where he led the Ubuntu security team, and currently he's working at Google on Chrome OS security. And I'll just let uh, Case take it from there. So this talk is uh, mostly just some ideas about uh, designs for securing Linux systems and some low-hanging fruit, um, things like that. Uh, if you haven't already had the chance, you can download my slides there from that URL. Um, and then on every, on every presentation I give, I, uh, I always cheat and I show people how to pronounce my name, which is just Case. Um, it's spelled K-E-S, that's the, the Dutch spelling. Blame my grandfather, but uh, well, that's my name. Um, I respond to both, but I figured I'd just start doing that on all the slides. Um, so, uh, <coughs> just a little introduction about me. Um, basically, uh, I like I like breaking into computer systems, so um, I figured I should do something about that uh, that was productive. Um, I've been going to uh, DEF CON for quite some time. Um, DEF CON not familiar with it is uh, probably one of the, the largest uh, you know, computer hacker conferences in the world, and they run a contest each year called Catch the Flag. Um, it's a team-based challenge where uh, the teams try to break into each other's computers and defend their computer from other people, and uh, I've sort of been uh, working on my skills and making friends and building teams, and so we got a team that uh, won in 2006 and 2007. Um, it was a lot of work, so on to trying to do other things. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of Debian. I'm a Debian developer and, and an Ubuntu developer. Um, and ultimately, I, I managed to channel my, my tendencies and sneakiness into securing computer systems as opposed to uh, breaking into them uh, as the primary job. Um, I worked at the, the open source development lab um, that was here in Portland. It was uh, what sort of the predecessor to the Linux Foundation, um, the folks that uh, pave my store vaults. Um, and quick trivia I just try to share with everyone about uh, having hired Linus Torvalds at OSDL, he worked from home, of course, um, but anytime we gave tours at OSDL to show off the lab and these other things, people really wanted to see where Linus Torvalds sat. Um, and we always had to say, oh, well, you know, he works from home, and get these blank stairs, and it's like, no, okay, this isn't working. So one day we decided actually to print out a nameplate for him and put the Linus Torvalds nameplate on an empty cube at OSDL, and then anytime anyone asked, hey, where is Linus Torvalds sit, we could say, well, he works from home, but here's his cube. And people would take pictures of the empty cube and do other things like that. So anyway, OSDL was a lot of fun. Um, uh, I moved on to uh, working at Canonical on the Ubuntu security team, um, and then moved to uh, Google, where I'm mostly focusing on uh, Linux kernel security uh, for Chrome OS and for upstream. Um, so about this talk, uh, we're going to talk about security. And uh, the first thing I want to do is try to convince you that it's important um, and that the, the, the direction I'm going with it makes sense. Um, and I'm going to cover some areas um, for how to design your systems and some low-hanging fruit that and then finally to beg you to start working on it immediately. Um, so the first part, what do you mean post-intrusion? Um, the idea here is that uh, most security breaches and problems um, with, with services and system security aren't a single bug anymore. It's, it's a long chain of attacks um, that gets an attacker uh, what they want. So you know, the standard progression of an attack is, is more like this, where you find a bug in the public-facing service, and then you find a bug underneath that that gets you a privilege escalation, and then you find a bug that maybe gets you into the kernel uh, execution area, and then maybe you can move on to doing more remote attacks on another system, and this sort of continues. Um, examples being um, the, the 
somewhat recent uh, kernel network penetration, which was sort of like this, this series of stolen SSH keys, kernel bugs, and backdoored SSH demons. Like, there's this whole train of attack. Um, uh, and then more recently, um, what was affecting some web servers, uh, people discovered that they were having iframes injected into their the outbound web services and wanted to figure out where they were coming from, and eventually they located it as a kernel rootkit that had been installed and was actually injecting iframes containing malware links and whatever else into the outgoing TCP streams. It was um, pretty scary. But I mean, all these things uh, sort of in the, in the information security community tend to get called the advanced persistent threat. Um, and by advanced, I think it just means successful. Um, so, and for those of us using Debian and Ubuntu, uh, the acronym APT is very confusing. But um, anyway, uh, these are sort of the things that are going on in, in real-world attacks on actual systems. Um, and, and that's what I mean by post-intrusion. That first attack just gets you in. And then what happens from there? You really have to go through a lot of steps to, to expand the reach of your attack. Um, so it's important to defend against that. And that gets me to layered security. Um, and any well-designed system is going to have a lot of layers of security. Um, and this is, this is basically doing more than one thing to protect the entirety of, of what you've got set up. And there isn't perfect security. Um, so, you know, in, in a crazy world, you could sort of prepare to be breached at every single layer that you've designed and think about how do you, how do you contain a, a bug at any, of the, any one of those layers. Um, and it's, it's, you can go about this pretty systematically. Um, <clears throat> And the reason that perfect security doesn't exist is because there's bugs in everything, and people think about, okay, well, I have this, this file that only my user can read, which means no other user around can get at it. And, well, that is the design, and that's a good first step. What if there's a kernel vulnerability? And the kernel vulnerability completely bypasses permission checking. So you end up in a situation where it's like, okay, if we can just reduce the scope of what people have access to and their, their, what interfaces they have available, um, we're in a better position to, to defend against things. Um, so uh, another problem that exists in some software um, upstream development is this reasoning that, uh, oh, well, our code doesn't need to be defensive because there are no bugs here. So why should we be defensive about it? And that doesn't leave any room for mistake. Um, everything has bugs, so why not position the code so that if it encounters something that was unexpected, it deals with it gracefully as opposed to being exploitable and doing other things, you know? Even if it's, even if that condition, by your estimation, isn't possible, be defensive. Um, and that's more about development more than, uh, than, than security, you know, system configuration. <coughs> So I think um, uh, another, uh, one of the first areas to really look at is, is privilege separation. And I've broken this down into a couple layers here. Um, so I'm going to talk about you know, dealing with authentication tokens, whatever that means, uh, cleanly. Um, discretionary access control, or DAC, and that's the, the standard Unix permission model um, that most people are familiar with. Um, and the idea with that is that those access controls are ultimately up to the user in the Unix permission model. And then mandatory access control um, is sort of a stronger version of that, and it tends to be dictated by the system administrator, and it can further confine existing uh, DAC permissions. Uh, and then finally, sort of a little piece at the end, um, uh, talk about multi-factor authentication, since it's actually pretty easy and quite powerful. Um, so moving on to authentication hygiene. So I don't want to confine people's thinking to just SSH keys in this case, but anything that you use to prove to a system that you are who you say you are, um, these sorts of things should be applied. Um, it's, it's pretty broadly applicable, uh, in my opinion. Um, so, and as a quick aside, I want to try to encourage people to stop using password or only password-based authentication. Um, in fact, I have been trying not to say the phrase password, because that implies just one tiny little bit of text when you really want to say passphrase. But anyway, um, keep 
your tokens, your keys, your SSH keys, for example, encrypted, um, and tie them to a specific device, and don't put them on devices with remote access, because this means if you lose control of that system, you've lost control of all of the authentication tokens that it contains. And that might mean access to however many more machines. So if you confine your SSH keys, for example, to just your laptop, which doesn't have SSH uh, listening, or your phone, which in theory doesn't have too much listening, but is kind of scary anyway. But anyway, that also gets you better logging and finer control over, over the, the revocation of those tokens, because you know where someone is coming from at any given time. Um, so for some examples, um, like on a local device, your laptop, your desktop, whatever workstation you've got, um, that you, you find your keys. You know, here, those are the, the, you know, the two halves of the SSH private public key. That's all fine. And if you didn't have a password on your key, go add it now with that command, and you can actually set that up. So if someone steals your key, they would need to also have stolen it passphrase to unlock it. And theoretically, it is arguable that that is a form of two-factor authentication, but um, I'm not going to say that for, for real. Um, and then on a, on a remote system, uh, in the lower section, you can see there's, there's no keys. All we have is the authorized list of keys. You know, who's actually able to get into this machine? You know, where do they come from? And I, I like retaining the SSH, the SSH key comments because it tells you who generated on what machine and it's a little bit easier to um, figure out what is going on and you're, you're in a better position to revoke keys and remove them um, from access as you need to. Um, uh, and on top of this, uh, and this is a little bit SSH specific, but when confronted with confirmations, actually use them. You know, this is sort of a, a dead horse check your SSL cert, check your SSH key, whatever. But I find a lot of times um, the reason this sort of gets skipped over is just that people go, oh, well, I don't, I don't remember what the host key is to that machine, and I don't really remember how to actually find it. Because if you look on the system, you're kind of like, well, that's the file and the man page for, for SSH key gen, as opposed to this or show or something like that. Isn't, it's not obvious how to actually find this stuff, but you can actually dump the key contents um, with that command line um, there. So you just basically direct it to a specific file, which is the host key itself, um, and ask it, ask to report it. Um, and then if you want, you can do the, the cool little ASCII art thing, which is um, kind of fun. But um, I, I understand the reasoning for doing this, but it's uh, still just as not memorable as a long string of hex to me, but um, it's, it's fun to look at, I guess. I don't know. Um, so anyway, yes, please check confirmations. Um, so moving on to DAC. So again, this is standard Unix permissions, and what I've got here is sort of a design I like to use, but obviously everyone should adapt it to how they need for their environments, but um, sort of the basic ideas I've got is you've got an initial account that is tied to an actual human person. Um, and if you're, you're dealing with a lot, of, you know, a lot of admins or a lot of users, developers, whatever, this makes it a little bit easier to track who's got access to what because you don't have to go, oh, well, who's part of that role or who's part of this thing? If you're going to make accounts for people, actually make accounts for people. And you can manage the membership um, in other accounts uh, separately, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and then you've got your web services. And the role, the user under which those web services are running, is distinct from the other from the other pieces. It doesn't have access to you know, personal people's information. It doesn't have access to reconfigure itself or change its execution mode, because it's just supposed to do what it's been told and configured to do, and it runs in that small environment. Um, the idea being that you know, when an attacker breaches your service, they're in as that user, and they have a very confined set of permissions and access to that system, and they actually have to start jumping through hoops to elevate their privilege or change their privilege. Um, so, uh, and then another user for doing service maintenance, you know, what are they going to work on? Database updates, software upgrades, whatever, but they have the ability to change the behavior of that web service, but they don't have the ability to completely alter the system the way the root, the system, you know, the full sysadmin super user does. And then gets you to the final one, which is for you know, configuring device layouts and hard drives and whatever else. That, that's the, 
the tip of the iceberg, and you don't want to have that user being the one that's configuring things because there will be mistakes made. So, I mean, this is sort of like the classic application of discretionary access controls um, in the, you know, kind of a service environment. Um, and a lot of people do this. This is, this is a good way that things are set up. Um, oh, and another thing about this is it's good for logging because you can actually see transitions between privilege levels. Um, and I, I mentioned it earlier, but, you know, this, you know, when dealing with that permissions, actually pay attention to them, look at stuff, and make sure you're really keeping scripts and data separate. Um, there's been a lot of fun bugs where people can upload avatar images or whatever, but they can also upload a PHP script, and because that was, the avatar image area was actually marked as executable for the server, then they can just run arbitrary code. So, you know, keep careful control on that separation. Those privileges are, or the permission bits are there for a reason, and, like, be careful with keeping them separate. Really think about, well, why is this the way it is? Um, and um, keeping, uh, transitioning between privileges, I hinted at earlier, um, you can do with sudo. I like using sudo for that um, because you can really define specific roles and groups of people uh, and what they're able to change to. Or you can just do it through the SSH keys that I had showed earlier. Um, and so in this example, I've got you know, the some service group of people that's listed there. Um, and then you define that, okay, they from all hosts can become some maintenance user and run any command. And that gets you those privileges. After discretionary access control, there's mandatory access control. Um, many people are familiar with SE Linux. Uh, I prefer AppArmor. I find it a little bit easier to use. But there are actually uh, several available, um, Smack and Tomoyo. Um, I haven't personally used them myself, but they, um, all of these basically lump together do a similar thing, and they provide very explicit confinement over what a service is able to get at um, beyond discretionary access control. SC Linux has, has, a, has a, a tradition of being a little bit more difficult to deal with. Um, so I'm using a, a little demonstration here of using AppArmor as mandatory access control to confine a specific website that I host. Um, here, the, URL, the first URL there, there's the upstream documentation on a full walkthrough of how to confine a web service using AppArmor if you've got it available, starting from no confinement and working your way through each service. It's, uh, there's a lot of notes in the Ubuntu uh, default profile, too. The, the second line is the basically the, the default profile in Ubuntu for the Apache Preform daemon. And it defines a series of, uh, of profiles and hats, as they're called, um, that get used when you're switching, switching between uh, virtual hosts. Um, anyway, it also has pretty extensive documentation about the steps you can take. But um, as an example, I, I've got this site here, um, and it includes the things that are common to all of the Apache uh, clients um, and base, which is like access to various directories that it needs to actually operate, you know, shells, uh, not shells, but uh, shared libraries and things like that. And then this site happens to run PHP, so I have included the PHP abstraction, which includes all of the PHP-specific things, you know, the, where it stores session cookies, uh, you know, local, local caches and things like that as well as the specific paths that are allowed for this service. So, you know, when an attacker breaks into um, this virtual host, they're going to be running in this tiny, tiny box where they can run basically PHP, but only if it looks at the files that it was already able to look at by this profile. Um, and, and it keeps things very tightly confined, even beyond whatever what might be available for the web server uh, running with its users. And of course, all of this is assuming they don't have a kernel exploit, which would then bypass this layer entirely, which is why we want a couple layers. And this gets me to um, multi-factor authentication. Um, some people say two, but you can layer these on and on and on, so really you can have as many as you like. Um, one downside uh, to recommending sudo for, for privilege separation or for privilege changing, uh, is that in a way, basically have one passphrase for multiple accounts. You know, if I'm going to sudo to another thing, it's going to query me for my 
my own password. So if my password was compromised, then suddenly all of the accounts associated with my login with its sudo access are compromised. Um, again, you should use SSH keys anyway, but anyway. So um, I like adding another layer here that is very difficult to sniff, recover, whatever, because you actually need some physical object um, that I have or carry, or whatever. Um, there's a bunch to choose from. People have seen them all over the place. You know, there's like the standard HID RF RFID cards, um, the RSA tokens with a little number that cycles through, um, YubiKey, which will send, similar to the RSA key, but it sends a one-time password. Um, Google Authenticator is another one-time password that runs on an application on your phone. Um, and then Duo Security, the company called Duo Security has a Duo Unix thing. Um, they're free for personal use. I packaged it, um, so I really like it, but um, it, it does good things. Um, but any of these work, and it's actually pretty simple to put them in place. Um, anyway, um, I think YubiKey is probably another good one, but I liked I liked Duo Unix because it's entirely phone-based. It's over, it'll either call you or SMS you. I don't need any special application. I don't need anything installed. I just use it because it knows what my phone number is. Um, here's an example of installing Duo Unix. It is really straightforward. Um, so it requires an account on their site, like I said, and you just tell it what your phone number is, and it SMSs you things to confirm that. And, and then um, you configure the two keys it gives you so that your server can identify itself to the Duo Unix servers, um, and then you turn it on, and this this is a, a piece of Debian and Ubuntu, the, the, the PAM off update. You don't have to go around editing the PAM configuration files, you don't have to figure any of that out. Uh, these are the maintainer constructed, where should this PAM module fit into the global scheme of things in your PAM configuration. So you run PAM off update and you go, I want to turn on Duo Unix. Okay, and you're done. Very, very straightforward. No crazy editing, nothing like that. Um, and then here in the example, I clear my sudo cache and re-sudo, re it asks me for my password, and then kicks into querying Duo Unix, and it says, oh, well, either do you want me to call you, or do you want to type in the, your next one-time password that we SMS you, or do you need a new batch of them, or whatever. It's, it's really awesome uh, that way. Um, What's fun about this is um, with SSH, if you're using SSH keys, the SSH daemon isn't using PAM to authenticate you because it's using its own database. It's using its list of keys. So it does not actually run through um, the PAM auth stack. It'll use PAM session once it's validated who you are. Um, so what's interesting about this setup is if you install a two-factor like this, but you're using key-based SSH, your SSH key gets you into the system, but if you try to actually change your privileges with sudo, you're going to end up with a two-factor query. Um, and I, I kind of like that because it, it ends up with sort of two, two different two-factor authentication uh, schemes in place. But if you're still using SSH with, with passphrases, um, you have to turn on the challenge response config, and then you'll actually get the full prompt. Um, so you still can do it on connection. Uh, there's a bunch of different configurations that you can look through uh, if you really want to. Uh, there's a lot of the details about how to, how to tweak it. Um, so on to uh, kernel tunables. Um, this is some more low-hanging fruit. Um, this is sort of a, a small selection of options that I, I get the impression some people don't entirely understand or options that are relatively new to the kernel. Um, some of these are already configured in your distro, um, but many aren't for some reasons I'll cover. Um, so, so do look through these. Um, as kind of an aside, uh, while looking for a good picture for this slide, uh, and I had Googled things like too many knobs or many buttons, uh, I found this image and I, I just could not pass it up. I mean, look at the hard hats. You know they're serious, it's, it's great. Um, and as a, as a complete random uh, bit of trivia, this room does not exist anymore. Uh, it turns out this is actually part of the Oregon uh, Trojan Nuclear Facility uh, here in Oregon on the Columbia River. Um, uh, 
turned on in 1976 and shut down in 1992 and uh, went through a controlled demolition in 2006. So that was really fun to watch. But anyway, random trivia about the guys at Hard Hats. I love it. Okay, back to security. Um, so if you're not familiar with um, Linux kernel tunables um, or syscontrols, uh, they're all in proc, slit, uh, proc sys. Um, I tend to like using one of the command line tools called uh, sysctl to work on them, but they're just files. You can read and write them with whatever you want. Um, um, the, the documentation is a little scattered, but um, mostly it's in the kernel source itself uh, in, in, that in the documentation syscontrol directory. Um, that's good once you find it. Um, it's, they're sort of in the man pages, but the, the main place to find this is in documentation syscontrol. Um, which is too bad. I was I couldn't find a particularly better place to point anyone to to look at these, and um, I felt like it was important to document them because there's like 1,300 of them. I mean, most of them, most no one wants to look at. Um, only a small subset of them are particularly interesting for security, but I mean, there really are a lot of them. Um, anyway, so here are some examples of looking at. A specific syscontrol. This is the randomized VA space syscontrol, and um, this controls how user space uh, processes have a randomized memory layout as a security defense. So if your system doesn't say two here, uh, you need to fix something and or yell at someone. Um, that, that should really be two by now. Um, another one is the, the IPv4 TCP SIM cookies. Um, and if you're not familiar with this piece, uh, when the kernel accepts an incoming TCP connection, or starts accepting them, I should say, um, normally it stores the details about this connection in memory and waits for the other half to finish the TCP handshake before continuing. Um, when a lot of connections are pending, uh, this is a SIN flood uh, uh, attack, a denial of service attack, um, the kernel has the option to switch to actually encoding all of this information in its response on the, during the TCP handshake. So it doesn't actually need to take up any memory to do that. Um, what this means, actually, is that it overloads a bunch of, uh, of the TCP headers for options. Um, and that means things like window scaling doesn't work anymore. But frankly, in the face of the denial of service, I'd kind of rather still have a connection at all than have perfect bandwidth mediation and scaling. Um, but I think an important thing to note about this is uh, if you turn it on, you don't suddenly lose all those options. Uh, you only the kernel will actually enable it once it sees it's under memory pressure and has lots of outstanding connections. So it's actually a dynamic system that once it's under attack, it will engage this to try and protect itself. Um, so fundamentally, there's no reason for this to be off. Um, you basically only benefit from it. And some distros turn this on, but it's worth checking, I think, um, because I think there's historically there's some misunderstanding about um, what happens with it and what effects there are in enabling it. And it's a, it's a nice front line for DOS. Um, this is about a, about a debug facility in the kernel. So um, this controls ptrace, uh, which if you're not familiar with it, is used to examine and control other processes on the system. Um, it's what's used for, uh, on the back end by tools like strace or gdb. Um, however, it's really quite dangerous. Um, the thing that really drove this home for me was that there are processes running on your system that hold a credential in memory in their own process that accepting ptrace, there is no way to access them. You can't get at them through any interface. There's, they, they, it's in their memory, and when they shut down, they're just going to get rid of it. An example of that being you know, an SSH connection or a connection to another system. Um, so imagine if you're logged into a bunch of machines over SSH, and some attacker manages to gain control of your user ID on that system. And without elevating their privilege in any way, just as you, they can walk through all of the SSH connections you have and actually establish an additional tunnel through that SSH connection to those remote machines uh, because of those privileges that SSH has running in memory. So that's really, really scary, and we don't want you know, sibling processes to be able to manipulate each other in that way. Uh, so. Ubuntu has, has this feature. It is upstream now, um, and I, I wrote this, but um, it's uh, it basically disables that, and you can crank it up even higher and completely knock out ptrace on the system entirely, although that has really bizarre effects on some things. 
Um, so it's it's kind of if you're going to go crazy with it, it's really only going to work in very specialized environments or embedded systems and things like that. But um, I've been trying to convince other distros to turn this on. Uh, but if you build your own kernels, I recommend enabling YAMA and turning this on because uh, it'll gain you a little bit of defense in one of the kernel interfaces, yet another layer. Um, so uh, like like VA randomized space earlier that I mentioned. Um, if this value isn't set on your machine, you need to find someone to yell at. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate a program with a very, very small change. Um, people might be familiar with the classic uh, you know, null pointer dereference crash as demonstrated here. You've got a pointer to a structure. It's set to null. You dereference it in the printf, and it crashes because there's nothing at null. Um, but if people haven't really taken a close look at this, um, it's not obvious that null is just a special value that's been overloaded. Um, it's just address zero. Zero is still a valid memory address. It's just that there's a convention that it isn't mapped. It isn't available. So if we change this to add a request to the kernel to please map memory address zero at this fixed location, um, this program completes with no problem because it dereferences the structure that's at zero, looks at the memory, the memory is there, it happens to contain you know, empty memory because it came from the kernel, and it completes successfully and finishes. There's no problem with this. Um, the real danger here is that the kernel itself is running in the same virtual memory space as the user space. So when a process makes a system call into the kernel, like open or write or any of these other interfaces. Um, the CPU switches modes into kernel mode, uh, but continues running in that memory layout. So if the kernel happens to perform a null dereference, it will start looking at the memory that user space has mapped. And this can lead to really ugly things and uh, quick permission escalation. Um, it's very ugly. So the, the point is, no one actually uses this range of memory, or they shouldn't be, uh, except in really special conditions. CPU emulators and stuff like that. Um, so just disallow mapping of like the first 64K of memory. Um, not a lot of structures are going to be bigger than 64K. So um, really make sure that this one is set up because uh, it's quite it's quite a nasty way to jump from user space directly into kernel space with no special privileges um, if someone finds a kernel bug. Um, again, luckily, this is the default upstream, and if it's not set, freak out and figure out why. Um, but I just, I just really want to call attention to it because it's, it's, a, it's a bad one. Um, this is somewhat recent, um, the K-pointer restrict. Um, so there's a lot of kernel debugging facilities uh, in, the, in the proc file system. Um, and in my opinion, there's basically two types of people that need this information, uh, kernel developers and attackers. And if you're a system admin debugging a kernel you're about to become a kernel developer, so that's still a kernel developer. Um, and in the same way that kernel developers are using this to fix bugs and solve problems and whatever else, um, attackers are using this information to mount their exploits. Um, if an attacker has to guess at a value instead of being able to just trivially look it up, uh, they're going to run into a lot of problems in trying to have a reliable exploit. Um, as an example, if, if they don't know the value of one, one byte, although it's usually quite a bit more that you need to know, they would have a 1 in 255 chance of landing an attack. And if they actually thought that they should mount that attack, you know, on a, let's say, a, a large uh, cloud host that had lots and lots of machines, and they scattered this attack across thousands of machines, technically they're still going to land it a couple times, but I'm pretty sure the sysadmins are going to notice the other 99% of their machines going down. Kind of the nice thing about the kernel is if you mount an attack against it and you screw it up, there's a really good chance that you just took that machine out completely. Um, so it'll take a, you know, a potential exploitable vulnerability and turn it back into a denial of service. And uh, people are monitoring their systems usually a lot better than some demon that is forking too fast because someone's beating on it. Um, so again, um, this is mostly for debugging. It, it shows the specific addresses and a number of files about where things are located in the kernel. That's just not useful. So turn on the restriction, and all those values go to zero for everyone who isn't root. Um, it's, it's painless. Uh, 
So at least Ubuntu ships this way. Um, I wish more did, but uh, some people are really resistant because it turns out that the people who are involved in making uh, Linux system distributions tend to be kernel developers. So they look at this and they go, oh my god, I can't lose this debugging information. I don't think our distro should do this because I use it. Without really looking to the fact that, oh, but what about the other millions of people using your distro that do not want this? Uh, but related to kpointer restrict is dmessage restrict. Um, again, very much like kpointer restrict, but it's for dmessage. Um, no distro I know of actually fits with this restriction enabled because so many debugging scripts for so long actually call the message to get as much information they can about a system to report a bug or whatever. Um, I, it's part of nearly every bug information collection script on the planet. Um, however, um, if you limit, limit the message to root, um, it seems fine to me in daily operation. I've been running all of my machines with this set for a long time, and all it does is reduce the amount of information that's exposed to a potential attacker. It doesn't stop anything else from working, so why not make it harder um, for an attacker to deal with your system? Uh, the, the old adage of, you, know, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun the person behind you, or something similar to that. Make them move on. So turn on this restriction. Um, it's another easy win in some, more, some of the more recent kernels. Um, much more recently, uh, since the 3.6 kernel, I think, is uh, protected symlinks. Um, and this, this talks about basically an entire, like, a classic class of privilege escalation vulnerability known as the temp symlink race or the predictable, predictable temp file name, um, et cetera, which boils down to time of check, time of use race, where you go, is this file here? Oh, it's not? Well, then I'll open it. But in between those two things, maybe it got created, um, and a bunch of other things similar to that. But um, so this this here is an example of sort of a, an attacker setting up to do bad things by making a sim link to a predictable file name in temp and linking it to you know etsy cron dot evil, hoping that they can actually populate this with with a script that will get run by root, and then they'll have privilege escalation. Um, and you know they've got the sim link there, and here's the script that checks the file. And, echoes stuff into it, and then root at some point runs the dangerous script or the buggy program or the buggy daemon or something basically is going to work on this predictable temp file, and suddenly it's written, it's followed the symlink and written into a bad location. So the idea is that you've got root following a symlink created by someone else um, that was able to predict that behavior. And this is a giant class of problem. You see, I don't know, I've seen uh, this forever. It's uh, it's, it's a very large uh, class of attack. But um, the embarrassing news about this is that there has been a solution for this flaw for something like 16 years. It's been in other really specialized distros like OpenWall and GR Security and things like that. Um, but there was a lot of political pressure against using it because it changed the semantics of the POSIX file system. Um, but... Uh, I was crazy and decided to actually try to get this upstream in the kernel. Uh, I put on lots of layers of asbestos and fought for it for a couple of years. Um, and it's, it's actually finally been merged. Um, and uh, the problem was that it, the, this corner case that it solves was only there really for an attacker. There was nothing actually using this in daily life. Um, so if you look here, if you've turned this on, what happens is that script runs and it says, I'm not going to touch this symlink. So when enabled, symlinks in a world-writable sticky directory, which is basically temp, var temp, and these are places where you end up in a situation where there might be multiple users working on the same, uh, same file system area, um, the, the symlink can't be followed unless the owner of the symlink matches the user who's trying to follow the symlink. It's a really straightforward fix. And it solves the entire class of vulnerability. Um, though I would, as an aside, I would note that if you had mandatory access controls in place, uh, this would also get caught. Uh, because, you know, let's say in your mandatory access control list, you said, okay, temp, you can write to. And then the daemon starts up and starts following, you know, working on temp and follows the symlink off to some other location. And the mandatory access control says, no, I didn't want 
launch and we're talking about. So, you know, there are multiple ways to solve these things. Um, and obviously, when you're going to have many layers of security, sometimes you're solving the same problem a couple times, um, so they can overlap from time to time. Anyway, so like I, I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a recent setting uh, since Linux 3.6. Um, it's disabled by default upstream, unfortunately, because there is one piece of software written in 1992 that happened to use it and break, so it got turned off. But anyway, um, it's enabled in Ubuntu, um, and I think I've managed to convince the Fedora and Red Hat folks um, to do the same now. Uh, so in theory, this should be set, but please check it. It solves a whole bunch of problems. Um, related to the Simlink uh, protection is Hardlink protection. And, and this one still, still surprises me a little bit, so uh, Hardlinking is a lot of fun. Um, in, a, in, in sort of this principle of least surprise, uh, assuming we've got the you know, two directories in the same file system, because you can't link, you can only hard link on the same file system, um, what do people think happens when you try this? You hard link a file you have no access to whatsoever. And the answer is, it goes ahead and makes it. And this, every time I see it, it just floors me. Um, so this means that an, any user can control the file system location of a file in a way that they have no access to. In fact, it even retains the permissions, the owner, everything about it. So this allows me, as that user, to anywhere that I have right access to, to create hard links to files that I have no business dealing with. So I can, uh, and this leaves all kinds of problems. I can DOS the file system by filling up the inodes on that file system by just creating thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of entries for this one file. Um, another good one is you can uh, pin a flawed set UID binary. Like, let's say the sudo binary has a bug in it. And let's say your home directory is also on the same file system as user, which is not a good idea. But you can actually create a hard link to the set UID sudo and it has all the same permissions, it's owned by root, it's still set UID. Now the system comes along and upgrades its software, and it believes it has removed and replaced the buggy sudo. But since you have a hard link, the system just deleted the one that was in SBIN or wherever. And you retain a full copy with perms as root sudo of the vulnerable binary. So like, this is a really, really bad place to be. Um, and additionally, you can still, like if similar to symlink attacks, if you could trick a vulnerable a daemon or service or something into following a path that you control, it happens to be a hard link to a file it has right access to, you can modify it. Um, but anyway, the point is, this all gets really nasty. Um, so if you turn on protected hard links, um, this isn't allowed. You can't hard link to something you don't have read and write access to. Um, and if you read the POSIX spec very carefully, this is perfectly valid. Um, you're a, a, a POSIX implementer is allowed to choose how to deal with this situation. They can either do what they did before or do this block. Um, and basically nothing depended on this unexpected feature of POSIX, similar to the Simlink stuff. Um, strictly speaking, the, the at daemon uh, did rely on this feature, but it was kind of a mistake anyway, and it was a two-line change to fix it. Um, but anyway, this is enabled in Ubuntu as well. Um, it should be on in Fedora, similar to the Simlink protections. Um, but again, it's pretty recent. Keep an eye out for it uh, and, and look for it. Um, because I think this is, this is valuable and is unfortunately disabled by default upstream. So I'm trying to make sure people are aware of it. <coughs> and then my last example on kernel turnables is, is this one, modules disabled. This is another fun one. Um, so kernel modules, as you may be aware, uh, allow user space to extend the functionality of the kernel. Um, now, another way to look at this is that the root user can trivially run code in kernel space, uh, since they're handing the kernel a module to run. Like, here, please run this code. Um, sort of the definition of a vulnerability. But, um, uh, and this is used to, ex you know, normally to extend hardware support and do these other things um, uh, on a machine. But, um, while there's plenty of completely normal kernel modules, your Wi-Fi module, the, you know, whatever USB thing you've plugged in, um, kernel rootkits are made of kernel modules that are then loaded into the kernel using, uh, using this mechanism. 
and kernel rickets are, can be pretty evil stuff. They're hard to detect. Um, this calls back to the iframe injector uh, that I mentioned earlier. This was a, a kernel module that got loaded by a malicious piece of software and was messing with people pretty badly. Um, so it makes sense to draw a pretty hard line between the root user and uh, you know, the kernel execution environment, or, or ring zero. Um, these things should be considered separate separate things. Uh, and this tends to be especially true for um, hosting services, you know, usually VPSs that have an off-disk kernel, where you're, you're booting your image from a kernel that is defined somewhere else that isn't necessarily on the disk. Um, many of them tend to turn off modules anyway, but just in case, uh, this is another good idea. So um, again, for laptops and desktops, whatever, um, since you're supporting various hardware and you want to be able to plug things in and whatnot, disabling modules tends to get in your way more than it is a benefit. Um, but on servers, there is significantly less call for needing unexpected arbitrary modules. So once you know what you need, you can turn off module loading and suddenly, if someone has managed to get through your service, get through your DAC, your Mac, or whatever you've got set up, escalate all the way to root and try to really uh, put this into, you know, attack your kernel execution environment, they're then stumped by this. They need to find a legitimate kernel flaw to then get their execution, as opposed to just handing modules to the kernel and saying, hey, please be evil. Um, so what I like to do is, uh, since it's a little confusing for me to have module loading that is controlled by the mod pro program and sys controls, uh, it's related to this because it's a syscontrol value, but it's really mod probe. Anyway, I like having, uh, I, I define an alias for mod probe called disable. And when it encounters uh, this disable, it just runs the syscontrol to turn it off. Um, and this lets you actually use things in, in mod probe, like uh, at the end of rc.local, you can say mod probe disable, and suddenly all the modules are off. Or um, you can even list it in your etc modules file where you're listing all the modules you definitely want to have loaded. At the end, you say disable, and it's loaded all the modules and disable, and you're done. Um, some, depending on your on your distro, uh, you may not want to use etc modules because you might be racing other things. You know, the thing that's loading modules might be running right alongside your firewall bring up script, and halfway through the firewall script, modules get disabled, and suddenly the firewall can't load all the random modules it needs to, to do its thing. So putting it at the end of RC local tends to work, or anywhere else um, that seems like a good place for it. Uh, and um, so that's the end of that. Uh, and now I beg you to start today. Um, you know, make, make a plan for anything. Whatever, anything in here that looked good or other stuff that you thought of or you've been meaning to do, um, you know, just make that plan. Um, if nothing more, it's a plan you deviate from, and you've still got a plan, but you know how, why, and where you deviated from it, um, it's really good for the next plan uh, that you make. Um, and obviously prioritize the changes. Um, if you're logging in as, you know, as root over Telnet um, to make database changes or something, it really doesn't matter for you to configure your mandatory access control. It just doesn't make sense. So you know, get things in the right order, pick the, the right low hanging fruit. Um, and then ultimately, I like to say, you know, verify these changes. These, these are system settings like anything else. You know, if, if you've got some automated checking service looking that, you know, looking for that port 80 is listening for your service, um, check these settings too. Um, make sure something didn't accidentally turn them off or, you know, a new image install that you've got uh, didn't lose that customization or something like that. Make sure you can't load some arbitrary kernel module. Uh, make sure that proc k all sims is filled only with zeros. You can't read those things. Um, it's really the only way to be sure. Um, so just uh, do that. Uh, and uh, that's the end. Um, I think I have time for questions. Yes, I have a little bit of time for questions. Um, if anyone has anything, there's a microphone there because they're recording this. Um, I can be reached uh, at some combination of those addresses. Um, and that's the link to these slides again, uh, if you want to take a look at them uh, more closely. Well, I hate to do this to you, but I actually need to make an announcement. Okay, go you don't mind. Uh, my name is Matt Harmon. I'm the web manager for FEMA, a uh, federal emergency management agency. As you know, we had a little bit of a situation in Oklahoma yesterday. 
And what we are looking to do is pull together an initiative. Uh, it's uh, Drupal for Oklahoma, actually. And what we'd like to do is uh, at 7.30 tonight in the Coder's Lounge at the Doubletree Hotel, if you'd like to help out, uh, we are looking to stand up a site that will help the victims and emergency responders on the ground. We want to develop a website that will coordinate transportation and help deal with housing issues. These are two immediate needs that we need. Hopefully, we can get a site set up by tomorrow morning. It's one of those things that my team is already in town for DrupalCon, and we figured we've got this resource here. We've got all these wonderfully uh, intelligent folks. Uh, hopefully, a little bit of civic good to get it done. So uh, if you'd like to, 7.30 tonight at the uh, uh, Coder's Lounge in the Doubletree Hotel, come out and help us. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm a systems administrator with Open Concept Consulting in Ottawa. Um, I don't want to give away too many details, I guess, because as you mentioned, DEF CON at the beginning of your <laughs> presentation, I don't know how many black hats are in the room. Um, but we're using sudo on our servers. Uh, our developers log in using SSH keys. We use sudo, and we have sort of a common account for managing our Drupal sites. And one of a couple of my developers are sort of mildly frustrated because they also have root access because they're capable people and they need to do, you know, Apache changes and uh, system admin type stuff in addition to just the, the management of the Drupal sites. Uh, and so a couple of them are saying, like, it's really annoying to become this Drupal management user, but then I also have to become root because I have to change this other thing, and I gotta always be switching back and forth, and it's just, I don't know if you have any suggestions in that regard. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, it, it depends on if... I mean, if it's a if it's a social need or a technical need, right? mm -hmm. if, it, if it's really a so you know if it's just it's frustrating to do it, then I don't know, maybe some tooling needs to be changed or something like that. But but ultimately, I mean, there's a reason for separations, and yeah, exactly. there should be a documented process. And if anyone has questions about it, you go, hey, look, this is why we do it. This is why it's important to us to have this separation. But if it's legitimately like a technical hurdle that really doesn't make sense and can't be supported by any good design ideas, then it makes sense to change it. So. I think, I don't know, I mean, I've, in those situations, I tend to have two terminals running. You know? yeah, yeah, well, me too, that's my solution. Yeah, that's what so, I've been trying yeah. to tell them. I've, I've gone through the process of sort of scripting up some stuff that is very common as well. Yeah. And then sudoing a lot, like allow that through sudo. Yeah. Only that one script. Exactly. And, and that works pretty well. Okay. That's a good way to go. Okay. Um, and those, when I get really paranoid, I try to actually use a mandatory access control around that script too, just yeah. in case there's crazy stuff that goes yeah, around it. I just like confining processes. Or yeah, cool. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Well, awesome. Uh, if uh, anyone does come up with any other questions, feel free to email me. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you very much.